think your spouse is the only one lying to you about his infidelity or addiction to porn? Guess again. The truth is you've probably bought into at least three other lies. Hi, I'm Kim Pullen and welcome to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. And today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the lies that are involved in infidelity. And they're not really what you think. But before we dive in, I wanted to introduce myself for those of you if this is your first time visiting. Again, my name is Kim Pullen and um, I am the founder and creator of Hope for Spouses. And we have a, a Facebook group, life, uh, public Facebook group, uh, page. We have a private group, uh, a website, a podcast, and we have a YouTube channel with lots of these videos. And the reason I do this is because I really want to give women especially hope uh, that their marriages that they are caught in where there is betrayal, uh, that there is hope for them to change. And um, I do that because my husband and I were separated for four years due to adultery. And in that four year time, I really got help that I needed. And my husband uh, went through his own struggles and ch uh, challenges. He lived with his affair partner for two and a half years. And uh, after that time period, he started working toward uh, re reconciliation and he put, got himself in a group and he got accountability partners. And he, he really went through a major process of change. So both of us had to do our own thing, but really the thing at the center of it was God and we couldn't be where we are right now. We've been back together for about three and a half years and we have an amazing marriage. Um, partnership is incredible. The trust has been rebuilt. Um, I'm just really encouraged by how God has really worked. So I do this because I really want to give other Christian women hope that yes, their marriage can be resurrected, um, but we've got to just do our part in order to be able to make that happen. We don't have any control over what our spouses do. But today, um, I want to talk about a few things that um, when we when we go through these this betrayal that happens in our marriage, um, we really recognize that are there are only a few things that really can damage a marriage almost irreparably, where you can't repair it again, um, and that is deceit. Um, when my husband and I were in the process of that reconciliation, I was talking about, and he was in his active recovery. Um, he was going to the group. He had an accountability partner. He was being very open um, with the accountability part. And he was, uh, had spiritual men around him. <clears throat> it took him about, like I said, about 18 months of really being intense. But even during that time, I was learning that he was going to slip. He was going to make mistakes um, as he was fighting to figure out how to stand strong, how to not give into Satan over and over again. And it was amazing to me how God always exposed um, in whatever bizarre way that God did work. Um, whenever my husband did have contact with his affair partner, um, usually an email or something, um, that God always brought it out. That I, I didn't even have to go looking for it. God exposed it. But I was very open with my husband. I basically told him, I said, I can handle the slips. I can handle that. What I can't handle is when you're deceitful. I can't handle the deceit because I don't I don't know what to I don't know what's going on in our relationship. We can't build trust in a relationship where there is lies. So that was a huge part of um, our rebuilding the trust as he was just starting to become very open. But as betrayed spouses, sometimes we feel like we're playing a cat and mouse game with our spouse. Um, but I'm going to tell you the secret that healthy, godly. And spiritual wives in recovery know. And that is your spouse's lies uh, aren't the only ones that you have to watch out for. And those are a lot. But the worst ones are the ones that we listen to that don't come from our spouse. So what are they? Okay, so the first lie is that you are the hero and your husband is the villain of the story of your life. And I know it can feel that way. That you're, you know, you've been just hit you know, your life is imploded or exploded um, based on the severity of your spouse's either his sexual addiction um, to pornography or um, his sexual addiction, uh, the affairs that he may have had, maybe multiple affairs uh, where he hasn't really dealt with the root of those things. And so your whole life is basically exploded, imploded. Your dreams have been dashed. It's affected your children. It's affected your relationships with friends and family. Um, but the truth is that the pain that we go through, the, the trauma that's going on in our life is really just, and I want you to hear me, this is a subplot, okay? 
to the big picture of what is going on. And if you read the Bible at all, if you have uh, dedicated yourself to really worshiping God and following Jesus, then you're going to understand what I'm talking about here. See, Jesus is the real hero of the story, not us. And he's already won this epic battle. You know, he did it on the cross. And the real villain is not our spouse. It's not the people around us that hurts. It's Satan. Satan is the real villain. But he already knows he's lost the battle. But now he wants to take down every single person with him that he possibly can. He's already lost. And see, Satan is really sneaky. He doesn't come right into our face um, with his tactics, okay? He kind of sneaks in around the back, okay? And the weapons he used to destroy our marriage, I'm going to put some of those up so you can really see um, where they are. Okay, so Satan's weapons. Okay, so the first thing he uses, okay, is uh, you and your spouse's core wounds. Okay, um, things that happened in your childhood. You know, your um, spouse uh, or you could have been abused. You could have been uh, neglected, you know, emotionally abandoned. Um, there are so many things that can happen in our childhood. The, the secular term for are called ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences. But basically, they're wounds that we suffered in childhood that are um, that have continued to affect us as adults because we never dealt with them in our childhood. OK, the second one is our uh, lack of or weak relationship with Christ. OK, we may profess to being Christians, but unless our life uh, unless we're walking like Jesus, the way the Bible teaches, then, you know, Satan has us over a barrel. I mean, because we we, we are living without power. So Satan will use um, the fact that we don't have a strong relationship with God. We don't have a strong relationship with Jesus. And, and he will lie to us through our teeth because we don't know what the truth is because we're not reading our Bibles on a regular basis. OK, the next one is um, that ours and their lack of relationship with other spiritual men and women. OK. So if we are not tied into a healthy uh, spiritual group of people that, you know, they're in their word, they're mature, they've maybe been through some of the same things that we're doing, that we're going through. If we're not tied within those people, then, you know, we're we're out in the middle of the woods, out in the middle of the jungle, you know, with all the wild animals, Satan being the lion, trying to kill us. And, and we are powerless to stop it. So no wonder we are struggling in the way that we are. OK, our poor knowledge and application of the scriptures in our life. So if we're not reading the Bible consistently, if we're not, you know, reading commentaries and reading books and reading all the things that really help us to understand, because this, this, the scriptures were in a different culture. Now, we're still human and we still suffer the same challenges uh, of being human beings, but it was a different culture. So if we're going to really understand how this impacts us then we need to dig deep. We can't be shallow in our understanding. We can't just rely on our preacher to teach us about the Bible. We have to be active ourselves, okay? And then also our us and our spouse's fear and pride. Those are huge things that Satan uses uh, to really get us in, a, in a, a major, major way, okay? So Satan uses all of those. They're all tools that he uses, ways that he um, manipulates us so that we don't know what the truth is. Um, and in our overwhelming pain, us, our overwhelming pain of betrayal, you know, we, we get blind to the truth because our eyes are set on something other than God's word. They're set on our marriage. Okay. They're set on our spouse or they're set on ourselves and they're not really set on God. And because of that, um, we can't really, we, we, we get deceived very easily as far as what the truth really is. So, so how do we expose these lies? How do we expose the lies when they come into our relationship? So in uh, Colossians 1, uh, Colossians 3 verses 1 through 2, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Okay. So um, let me switch over here. So um, we have to do something which is totally against our nature. Okay. We have to set our sights. We have to set our mind and set our heart on things that are not of this world. 
that's really challenging for us, okay? Really challenging for us because we, we're bombarded with the world around us. And we have to literally see with spiritual eyes the battle that's going on that we that nobody else can see. But that's where we have to live. And if we're living that way, then we can interpret the things that happen in our marriage. We interpret them in a whole different light, okay? Now, the only one who can really unmask this master of darkness, Satan, the, the deceiver, okay, is the master of light. And that's Jesus, okay? The only way that we can expose uh, Satan's lies is by staying close to Jesus and thinking the way that he thinks, okay? So we're going to look at Jesus's, the weapons that we can have um, with Jesus on our side, okay? So the first one is developing intimacy with God through reading his word, okay? When we are consistently in God's word, when we're consistently studying his word, it begins to fill up our mind and our heart, okay? It becomes the way that, the way that God thinks is the way that we think. We got to consistently wrestle in prayer. Um, you know, reading God's word is the way that he talks to us and reading um, and praying is the, our way of connecting with God. It's a two way relationship. You can't have a one way. If you're just praying and you're not reading God's word, you're having a one way conversation with God, which really is not fair. It is not fair to God because you're not letting him talk to you. OK, um, if you if you think you hear God's voice but it contradicts the scriptures. How are you going to know unless you're reading God's word? You know, that doesn't even make any sense. So you have to be in God's word. If you feel like the spirit's talking to you, well, Satan could be talking to you, you too. And you don't know it unless you're in God's word comparing what's being told to you. So we have to, both of those have to be in play in our life. Okay. Addressing our own childhood wounds. Okay. You know, we have no control over what our spouse does, but we can address our own issues. If we were abused, if we were abandoned, if we were neglected, all of those things have a huge impact on our life. And so how we view our spouse, how we view the people around us can all be impacted through us addressing our own childhood wounds. Repenting of our need to control, okay? Um, the secular word is codependency. Um, God's word uses the term idolatry, okay? So one of the weapons that we can use is we're constantly repenting of our need to try to control what's going on in our life, um, which, of course, is run by our fear of what is going on in our life, okay? Getting out of isolation, forging a safe community with spiritual people who get it. Um, not your friends who've never been through this. They have no clue how to help you. Okay. We're talking about people who have walked this path successfully, who are doing it now and can tell you they can, they can spy a mile away when you're starting to get off course. Okay. They can tell, they hear it in your voice. They see it in your actions. You start to isolate again and they can call you on the carpet. Okay. We all need people like that in life. But unless they've been through this successfully and doing it spiritually, they are not going to be able to help you. Okay. So they may try to fix you. If somebody's trying to fix you, then they are not safe. Okay. So you got to find people who are going to walk you through this, but they're going to help you to figure it out on your own using God's word in order to really get healthy. Okay. So lie number two, the disclosure of your unfaithful um, the, uh, your spouse's unfaithfulness is bad news. Okay. It's not bad news. I'm actually, I'm going to, I'm going to go completely against what you're thinking. It is awesome news. It is fantastic news. You know why? Because God knew it all along. You didn't, but God did. Okay. Yes. It's heartbreaking. It has shattered your world. It has destroyed your dreams. Yes. You wish you could wipe it from your memory. Okay. This nine 11 that has completely, that's what we call it. Nine 11. It has completely changed the whole landscape of your life. Okay. Uh, nothing could lessen the devastation of this news. Okay. But it really is good. It's good for you and it's good for your spouse. You know why? Because the sin was already there. It's been there for a very long time and God knew it, okay? It says in Psalm 98, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And see, God knew about your spouse's sin. He knows about your sin way before 
that it was exposed to the light. Okay. God knew about it. He knew every, there's no detail about your spouse's sin that he is unaware of. Okay. And when our trust is in God, we can be a peace about that. Okay. As stuff comes out, God already saw this. God already, does it hit us? Does it devastate us? Yes. But God already knew it was there. Okay. He saw your spouse's sin when it was just a seed in your husband's mind. Okay. For a lot of them, if they're really into pornography, it began when they were children. Most of them were exposed to pornography at a young age. Okay. And, and God knew it, saw it then. He saw it way back then. Um, your spouse's actions don't surprise God in the least. So why is this good news? Because it's out. Okay, now God, your, your spouse and you have an opportunity to repent. Okay, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But now we have an opportunity to repent and change. God is so merciful. Um, when I first found out about my husband's um, multiple affairs, and he ended up leaving and going and living with his affair partner for two and a half years. Obviously, it was very devastating. And it took me some time to really think of it differently because after a while, I really started to think, you know, if God already knew this, then God was really being merciful in the way that he exposed this. And the way that I really saw it as merciful was because um, if my husband had died prior to his sin being exposed, and we would, at the end of times, come and stand before God, and God, knowing my husband's unrepentant sin, would have said, you go to hell. For me, I don't, maybe I would have been able to go to heaven. I'm not sure. We'll find out, you know, we all find out on judgment day. But I would have, I would have been like, why is he going to hell? Like what? And God would have been because he had unrepentant sin that nobody knew about, but God did. And so God allowed it to be exposed because he wanted my husband to repent. He wanted him to change. And by extension, he wanted me to change, to be different, to get out of my idolatry and stop living the way I was living. So God, in his love and in his mercy, okay, exposed this so that we can both repent and change. So I want to encourage you to change the way you view disclosure, okay? Change the way you view your sin against God. God is exposing it because he doesn't want us to stay in the same way that we are. We're, when, when we stay in unrepentant sin, it's like we're in a prison that we can't get out of. So when he exposes it, okay, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. All right, I want to look over here once. Okay, so do you feel powerless? Okay, that is good. Yes, I'm going to say it again. That is good when we feel powerless. Do you know why? Because in Romans 5, 6, it says, when we were still powerless, Christ died. Okay, so Jesus died so that we could be set free. But we didn't even really, I mean, it was before we were, way before we were born. But even before we really even knew about Christ, Jesus died. So we were powerless. It was that gave us access to Jesus because we admitted, have admitted to our powerlessness. Okay. And do you feel weak? That's good. You know, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says God's power is perfected in our life when we are weakest. This was the Apostle Paul talking about this thorn in his flesh, this thing that he had. And, and he wrestled. He struggled. He was like, God, please take this away from me. I don't want this. Three times. And God said, my power is made perfect in weakness. And, and we don't like being weak, okay? If you live in America, we really don't like being weak. It is goes against every part of our soul, every part of our culture. We don't like being weak. We will try to hide rather than being weak. But God says when we're at our weakest, that's when we're actually the strongest. Because when we connect with God, when we finally admit that we don't have the strength to do what we're doing, then God's power kicks in. And God us and God together, regardless of how weak we are, when we're with God, that's when we're the strongest we could possibly be. So, you know, wrap your arms around and be grateful for the fact that you feel powerless and you feel weak because now there's an opportunity for God to really unleash his power in your life. Okay, lie number three, your silence is protecting you. Your silence, your isolation, okay? Nobody knowing what's going on. Some of you live in small towns, okay? Some of you have family that would be appalled if they knew what was going on, okay? You can't possibly go to a support group where you don't know anybody and talk to these strangers, okay? Um, nobody needs to know what's going on. And I agree that we need to 
you know, have safe people in our life. But silence and saying nothing to anybody is you basically just put a bullseye on your back for Satan, okay? And the reason sometimes we do that is because we're afraid of what people are going to think, okay? We may be even afraid of what people are going to think about our spouse if we expose them. We're trying so much to even protect their reputation, even though they've already majorly trashed their reputation just by doing what they're doing. Um, but we work so hard to protect it and our reputation. And so we don't get help. And so we're literally being bombarded by Satan 24 seven, you know, in isolation, not knowing where to turn, what to do. And we think that's a good thing. No, no. Satan is lying to you. That is not a good thing. Okay. Silence is not the answer. Isolation is not the answer. Okay. You have to find safe people in order to help you move through your recovery. The truth is um, when we are in isolation, um, we are a prime target for Satan and, and God himself doesn't even exist in isolation. He has Jesus and the Holy Spirit in Genesis 126. God made the world in connection with the Holy Spirit in Jesus. Okay. So even God himself longs for connection and community. Um, I'm going to show you here too. Why? Uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, so here we go. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. Who can understand it? All right, if you are trusting in your feelings to get through this, guess what? It's not going to work, okay? Because our heart, our feelings constantly change, all right? They are up and down, up and down, up and down. Why would we rely on our feelings to tell us the truth? Feelings are the worst barometer for how we need to follow God, how we need to be obedient, um, following truth. It is the worst barometer. I mean, and we go through, I mean, you know, period, menopause, all the hormonal changes, and we're going to rely on our feelings. Oh, no. Now, it doesn't invalidate our feelings, but we're not going to use our feelings to make choices and decisions about what is right and what is truthful, okay? We, that's why we've got to use God's word. We've got to have that healthy community in our life to help us to weed through all those feelings and really do what God has called us to do based on the scriptures, okay? Let's look back over um, at this next one. So the purposes of a person's heart, this is Proverbs 25, is deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out, okay? So what we need people in our life to help us draw those things that are deep in our heart. We need that. We need somebody who has discerned. That's why I'm saying before that, you know, we need to have people who have done this before, who have gone before us on this journey because they have the insight. They know all the games that Satan plays in our mind. They know exactly because they've walked through it. They've walked the same journey. They've gone through the same thorn bushes. They had to go through the same quicksand. They've done it. They understand it. And so they're the ones that can help reach inside of us and draw that those things out and help us to really see the truth so we don't keep buying into Satan's lies. OK, now, sometimes we can feel like, well, I really don't I don't really need people. I can do this on my own. Well, um, the Bible will disagree with you. OK, so let's look one more time over here. Um, this is First Corinthians 12, 21 through 22, where, you know, Paul is talking about the church and he says the eye cannot say to the hand. I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. All right. So we may feel like we're at the weakest point. Okay. We are like, how can I help anybody with my life is a mess. But God says, Jesus, or Paul said, God said through Paul that when we're weak, we're indispensable to the church. I know we don't feel that way, but the Bible says that. So don't trust your feelings. He said, the I can't say, to the hand, I don't need you. The body has to work together. That's why it is called the body of Christ. It has to work together. We, we, we don't, we're not the best unless we're united and we're working together as God's family. So, sorry. So how do we address these lies? How do we address these lies and all the other ones that Satan throws at us? Okay. In Jesus gave us a great example in Matthew four verses uh, one through 11. I'm not going to show that because it's a really long passage. You can go back and read it for yourself. Um, it's when Satan tempts Jesus. Jesus goes in the desert. Okay. Um, he goes in the desert and Satan tempts him and Satan, you know, 
he knows exactly how to get anybody. Okay. So even with Jesus, he tempts Jesus with pride. He tempts him like, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the world. You know, he's hungry. So he's like, Ooh, turn this, you know, stone into bread. So all the way, all the weakest, you know, th uh, points in Jesus, that's what he hits. So of course he's going to do that to us. So he hits him. And so how does Jesus respond? How does Jesus respond to this attack? He uses God's word, okay? Yeah, you know, he used God's word to combat all the lies that Satan was throwing at him. Jesus was so familiar and so connected to God's word. He knew how to think. I mean, it was like, it was right there. It was right on the edge of his, not even his tongue, on the edge of his mind. It was always, he thought the way God thought. So he didn't have any problem when Satan threw stuff like that. Yes, he was tempted, of course. But you know what? He combated it with God's word. You know, he, he knew how to listen to God's voice. So how do we know how to listen? How can we discern God's voice? How do we discern Jesus's voice from all the other things that are screaming at us? Okay. So we're going to look at one more passage here, actually two more, but um, Jesus himself said, okay, this is how he discerned God's voice. He said, for I did not speak on my own accord, but the father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. All right. So Jesus himself was so connected to God. He goes further and he talks about in um, John uh, 5 and John 14 and on. He talks many times about how he and God are so one. Well, how did he get that way? From reading God's word, from prayer. He was so connected to God that literally the things that came out of his mouth were the very things that God thought. You know, so he, him and God were on the same wavelength, the same plane. Now, I don't know if I'll ever be able to be that connected to God. I'd love to be. But, you know, for us to be able to combat, you know, Satan, you know, to be able to discern God's voice, we have to have that same connection that Jesus did with the Father. Um, I love this. It says when he was in um, in John, he's talking about him being a shepherd. So, okay, this is John 10, 4 through 5. And he says, um, the shepherd goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So how do how do we how do we become so familiar with Jesus's voice? that we only follow his. When we when we hear something, whether it's the Holy Spirit or something talking to us in our head, how do we know that's really Jesus's voice? Well, because we're reading the word, because the word um, corroborates those things in our, in our heart and our mind, okay? It doesn't contradict it. So we have to be so connected to God's word so we can combat the lies that Satan throws at us daily, especially in the midst of our struggles with our spouse's betrayal. So if you do not know how to use God's word, you know, in your recovery process, if you, you know, read it sometimes sort of, but you don't really know how to literally go to scriptures, use specific scriptures, how to combat that. Well, that's why I'm here. Okay. I can help you. I've been there. I've done that. I've walked that path. Okay. And what I've learned, there are three ingredients to really healing God's way, okay? Yes, there are secular groups out there. There are um, a lot of amazing people out there who are, whose heart and their life are dedicated to helping you. But just to be real, they're not gonna, a lot of them are not gonna use God's word. Some of them will, but a lot of them are not gonna use God's word. They're gonna use secular, they're gonna use human thoughts, they're gonna use human theories in order to help you accomplish that. But they're gonna miss the heart and soul behind it, which is, you know, God's plan has been in existence way before any of us were here, okay? So three ingredients we need. First, we need a proven biblical strategy to get through this, okay? A proven biblical strategy. You can have all the great, the greatest tools in the world. You can have the best spiritual books. You can have... Um, you know, support groups, you know, you can have the, the most amazing counselor, but unless you have a strategy on how to put all of those together, it's just like, you know, being blindfolded and throwing things at a wall, hoping something will stick. Okay. So you have to have a strategy that can put all those together. That's biblically based. You also need an experienced guide. Okay. I've been there. I've done this. Okay. I've been helping people for several years to work through these issues successfully. And they're doing awesome spiritually. Some are still with their, some other with their spouses. Some aren't but they're doing awesome spiritually because they're constantly using God's word in order to change. Now, the third ingredient I can't bring, that's what you have to bring to the table, okay? That is a tenacity to get right, a tenacity to follow the truth. 
um, a resourcefulness to do whatever it is going to take for you to get healthy and close to God. And most importantly, it's a teachable spirit. Okay. Um, so whenever I present this offer, I always tell people that you, you got to come in ready to be coached. If you're not, if you're going to come in and you're going to argue or you're going to, you, you know, what your way is going to work, even though your way has not been working up at this point, then I can't help you. Okay. So you got to come in teachable and coachable. If you are, are ready for that, you can um, schedule a breakthrough call with me. It's a free breakthrough call. Hopeforspouses.com slash call. Okay. But please, 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 you know, don't, don't, call me, don't connect with me, don't even schedule a thing unless you're going to come really prepared for major changes because I will not be able to help you. I will not be able to give you the resources that you need. But if you're willing to be humble and teachable, you're ready to do whatever it takes and you're going to let God's word and not your feelings be the standard, then schedule a call with me. Okay. Hopeforspouses.com slash call. I'm going to put one more slide up so that you have this, okay? So again, schedule your breakthrough call right now, hopeforspouses.com slash call. I will see you next week here at Lunchtime Live.